basic errors of interpretation. Now, how many of you know what is John 3.16? For God so loved the world. Okay. Okay. Who wrote this gospel? John. Let's call him John. Okay. Uh, if you ask John, John, do you know what is John 3.16? What will John say? He doesn't know. Why does he not know? There were no chapter divisions at that time. So he does not know your John 3.16. The chapter divisions came only in the 13th century. That means 1200s. Your chapter divisions before that did not exist. Paul did not write Philippians in four chapters. Do you write a letter, say, chapter 1, verse 1? People say, man, you're reading the Bible too much. You write a letter. The chapter divisions came much later. And verse divisions, please write this down if you have not done this earlier. Verse divisions came in the middle of the 16th century. Now, you can, all this, by the way, if you're on, the, on Google, you can search Wikipedia. All this is there. Information is available now. So, these verse divisions and chapter divisions are not inspired. There is no magic about it. Some preachers even make some magical connection between this verse, the number of this, and put something along with this, and... There was all this. Finally, because the printing press was coming uh, in the 16th century, they wanted to put some numbers to help us. Sometimes they are helpful. But remember, when you read the Bible, there are no chapter divisions. That's why Biblica has produced a New Testament and a Bible where you can just keep reading the way it was written without numbers distracting you. And so the problem we have, we have a disease, all of us Christians, we have contracted a disease. And I call this disease versitis. It's called versitis. That's my name. Okay, I gave it that name. You will not find it in the dictionary. What is versitis? We look at verse without context. Every day we will receive WhatsApp message, Bible verses without any context. You know? Only nice sounding verses. I am with you. I will bless you. Thousand times. Why nobody says, you're going to die tomorrow? Well, that's also in your Bible. Eh? Woe unto you. Why is that also in your Bible? Why nobody sends us that? We'll just select a nice looking sounding verse and send it by WhatsApp. As a result, all of us have this disease. And pastors, unless we work at it, we have to cure ourselves first of this disease. First, we have to cure ourselves. Then we must read the Bible the way it was written and preach from that passage after passage. Then our people also will read the Bible like that. Many of us pastors, I'm sorry to say, the pressure of whatever we may make excuses, but we start thinking about the message on Saturday. Come on, be truthful, yes or no. Yes, some of us are truthful here. Because we have been busy. Saturday night we'll pray, Lord, give me a message. Sometimes we don't get it. So what do we do? Sunday morning, you wake up a little early. And then we put some verses together. Put, 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 put. Sometimes use a concordance. And we string a few verses and we have a message. And of course, God is gracious. He still will use us. But that is not the way the Bible was written. The Bible was written in writings. Some of them books, some of them letters. And I believe that's the way it should be preached. Otherwise, our people will never know any book in the Bible. They will only know verses. And we also will not know. So, what do we do? First thing, Philippians 4.13. We all know this passage. We usually use this passage to say whatever we want to say. I can do all things, brother. Yeah, I can do. God told me to build a church for, you know, a million people. And I can do all things. But that verse, Paul is not saying I can do all things. Please read that context. The context is in verses 10 to 13. Verse 11, he says, I have learned the secret of being content in all circumstances. Whether well-fed or hungry. Paul, how can you do that, Paul? I can do all things. Not through the one, but in the one who strengthens me. In the Greek, actually, it is en to endonomonte me. In the one who strengthens me. That's why in the Hindi, it's a better translation. 
उसमें जो मुझे सामर्थ देता है वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग so this verse is not about doing everything and anything i can do all things all things all brother is your bible say all does your bible say all and i can preach like that and everybody is excited all things all things so okay i can do all things let me tell you when i came as a student to sbc i believed that so i remember the first semester we were going to study greek so i took the file i can still remember i had a brown file and on that i wrote i can do all things through christ who strengthens me i'm going to study greek but that verse is not about studying greek yeah god will give me strength to do what i need to do that verse is about being content in all circumstances next verse you told me 22 verse 5 man shall not wear women's clothing women shall not wear man's clothing is this about trousers were men wearing trousers in that time hello no so that verse has nothing to do with pants and trousers it has to do with a man trying to dress like a woman a woman trying to dress like a man and by the way today in many many professions women have to wear trousers if you are a pilot thank god for women pilots if you are a nurse if you are a police person and many other fields women have to wear trousers she is not trying to become a man so it's not an issue of trousers or not this is about gender distinctive 1 Corinthians 3 16 17 this is a passage that can surprise us pastors and there from the beginning paul says it's about a church he says a church is like a field i planted apollos watered god gave the increase about the church and in verse 9 he says you are god's field and then he changes in verse 9 39 you are god's building and then from verse 10 to 15 he speaks about a church as god's building and he's warning the leaders that is us be careful how you build the church what kind of material you're going to use because one day not the district committee but the fire of god will test us and then whatever is bad material bad quality ministry will be burned up we may be saved but our ministry will be whew, finished and in that context verse 16 says don't you know that you plural in the greek it is you plural yourselves are god's temple he's speaking to the whole church and that god's spirit dwells in your midst Don't you know Corinthians that you together are the temple of God not my body by the way look carefully no mention of the body in this passage i know in 619 it is there that is in the context of immorality do not commit sin with your body because your body is the temple of the holy spirit that's in 619 not in 316 and then there is a warning to the pastors you never thought this was about pastors eh this was you thought it was about believers who have bad habits like smoking and drinking he says if anyone destroys god's temple what is god's temple the church it's a warning to the leaders if you destroy god's temple god will destroy that person for god's temple is sacred you together are that temple you together are that temple so this is not about the body not this verse sorry if i have taken away one verse that you used to preach against smoking and drinking we need to tell our people to take care of their health and um, all of us need to do that and pastor especially we should also take care of our health uh, that doesn't need a bible verse we brush our teeth not because the bible tells us to brush our teeth right we have common sense and with medical science we have lot of good things let's enjoy all that but this verse is about the church not about the body how do we know that context yes so one of the major problems we have is we don't read the context quickly next spiritualizing what is spiritualizing you take a bible and verse and you just spiritualize it okay uh, for example genesis 24 some people have used this story and i have been in pentecost for 41 years so i have heard this many times god the father is looking for a bride for 
Jesus, Isaac. Abraham is God the father. Isaac is God the son. Rebecca is the church. Eliezer is the... I still remember being in a TPM church where, of course, they don't allow ornaments. And so the preacher said, this bride does not need any ornaments because Eliezer's... Remember in that story, Eliezer actually gives real ornaments to the girl. But he says, Eliezer is the Holy Spirit. So the ornaments are gifts of the Holy Spirit. She has a gift of the Holy Spirit. She does not need all these ornaments. Wow. The beautiful thing is, yes, it's a beautiful story. Genesis 24. Yes, it is also true that God is preparing a church. But are these two correct? Is the connection between these two correct? That's a good question. Does anywhere in the New Testament anyone ever call Abraham equal to God? Isaac, like Jesus, Eliezer, Holy Spirit, Rebecca, church, anyone? No. So then it is not in the Bible. It is coming out of our imagination. Nice, holy imagination. This is called allegorizing. Now, maybe it is harmless, but still it is problematic. Do you realize that if you are saying Eliezer is the Holy Spirit, who was Eliezer in the family? A servant. He was not equal to Abraham and Isaac. Are you saying that about the Holy Spirit then? Be very careful. <laughs> what about Sarah, by the way? You missed her out. Eh? Oh, Mary, the mother of Jesus. So sometimes we spiritualize out of imagination and we draw connections which are not in the Bible. So for me, I'm happy if the Bible connects. In the New Testament, if there is. Otherwise, it is coming out of my imagination. It's not biblical. A lot of us find some interesting imaginative things. They may not be harmful, by the way. Harmless. But they are not biblical. That's all I'm saying. So, Proverbs 22 verse 28. What does it say? Yeah, actually it is not about customs, changing customs and all that. It is about don't steal somebody else's land. Proverbs 22 verse 28. But if you read Proverbs 23 verse 10, very clearly it will say, Don't move an ancient boundary stone and do not encroach on the fields of the fatherless. That means don't steal a poor man's land. So it's about stealing, not about changing traditions. So the stone here means a stone. But in Ephesians 2.20, Jesus' cornerstone is not a stone. All right? Very simple. Next, the word plate. I have given so many meanings of the word possible word plate. But the meanings come only from the context. Then you have a book in the middle, Hal Lindsay's book. I don't know, if, only if you have been there for the last 40 years and reading books, uh, Hal Lindsay wrote a lot of books about the coming end. He wrote all kinds of books and they sold in millions of copies. He made a lot of money. And every one of those books have led us off the track. He, see, look at the, what his book says, 1980s. When is it going to happen? Everything, the end will come in 1980s. We have to wait for it now. Look at the next book there, 88 Reasons. Not one or two or five or ten, brother. 88 Reasons, this writer, his name was Edgar Wisenant. He was a NASA engineer, very smart guy. Four and a half million copies of this book were sold. And he gave you 88 reasons how not to interpret the Bible. Because he was so sure that the rapture will take place in 1988. Harold Camping also made some calculation from the Bible. There are interesting people who do this all the time. You find them on television telling you about this and that and Russia and China and Germany and this and that. There are some people who are saying the two witnesses are coming so I am going to build a house for them in Jerusalem so please give me money. Very interesting. 150 million dollars was spent to tell the whole world that the end is coming on May 21st, 2011. 150 million US dollars. God's money wasted. This old man, somehow God used God's money to tell the whole world. He was from his interpretation of the Bible, sincere. Many people believed it. Then when nothing happened, he said, no, no, sorry, miscalculation, October 21st. And after October 21st, he said, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. And then he died a few months later because he was an old man. See, you can be a very sincere person 
but that doesn't mean some of our interpretations are always right. Major things. These are not major things. When Jesus is coming, you know, what did Jesus say? No one knows the hour when the Son of Man comes. But interestingly, some pastors know. Okay, Jesus said, you don't know the hour, but you can know the week. You can know the month. You can know the year. I've been hearing this kind of thing for the last 41 years. Every single preacher who gave a date, including some of our best known leaders, every single one of them, 100.00% were wrong. Therefore, my simple suggestion to you, my dear brothers and sisters, is please don't waste time listening to preachers or trying to figure out when the Lord is coming. Life is very short. We don't have time to waste. Let's serve the Lord. Let's not worry about when the Lord is coming. That is not. Most probably we will die before that and go to the Lord. Ah. So, this is definitely we don't know how to interpret the Bible when we do things like this. You know, in John chapter 21, Jesus said, do you love me? Remember that? To Peter, and what did Peter say? I love you. Then he said, take care of my sheep. Do you love me? He said, I love you, take care of my lambs. Do you love me? I love you, take care of my sheep. There are two Greek words there. One Greek word means agape is there, agapao the verb, and filio. What's the meaning of agape? What's the meaning of agape? Unconditional God's love. That's a good answer, not the right answer. Agapao means love. The meaning of agapao comes in the context. Agapao does not always mean divine love, unconditional love. Agape does not always mean that. Okay? For example, John 3.16, the verb agapao is used. God so loved the world. That is God's love, divine love, unconditional love, fine. But in John 3.19, it says... And the people loved darkness. Do you know the verb used here? Is ag also agapao. So then it cannot be unconditional God love. People loving darkness cannot be agapao. Right? So the problem comes when we think a word has a fixed meaning. The meanings of words and anything you say comes from the context. Now you will find many, many preachers making this blunder. Of saying, Jesus asked him, do you have first class love? Agapao. No, he said, no, I only have filio. Second class love. And do you love me? No, I only have second class love. Then third time, Jesus, okay, Peter, do you filio me? Yes, I only filio you. No, that's not true. Jesus was not speaking in Greek to Peter. He was speaking in Aramaic. And when he asked, do you love me? He said, yes, I love you. And he gave him the responsibility. Not the third time, every three times. So sometimes we miss, we, we forget that language is also contextual. We just think agape always means unconditional love. Not necessarily. See the text. All right. Uh, false combination. False combination is when we try to connect verses... And especially this has been done. Let me tell you, uh, I came to the Lord in 1978 from a non-Pentecostal background. But in three weeks, I still find it difficult to believe, I was pulled into a Pentecostal church. I was baptized, baptized in the Holy Spirit. And by the fourth week, I was preaching on the streets. I came from a completely um, you know, mainline denomination. In four weeks, I was preaching on the streets. Now, and what was I preaching? Whatever was I was told to preach. What was the books I was reading? Jesus is coming soon. 1982, 81, he'll come. Don't you remember those days? We used to give out tracks. What will happen in 1982? All the planets will come in line. Before that, rapture will take place. Repent. I gave out the tracks to everybody. Repent. What will happen in 19? Jesus is coming soon. Repent, repent, repent. And then the Lord told me, come to Bible college. So my friend said, you're going to Bible college? I'm thinking of, man, Jesus is coming now. I said, that is true. <laughs> it's okay, maybe from Bible college I'll go. All the kind of books that are like 88 reasons and those kind of things, our forefathers, Pentecostal forefathers preached it and wrote books about it. And they were all wrong. Why? Because they have what is called false combination. 
false combination. Two things put together that don't really mix. Look at the example I've given. This is how I remember my preachers, or I would do it, in fact, myself this way. How is Jesus coming very soon? Not Jesus coming soon, very soon. It's always in the next few years. He's going to come now. Frighten everybody. How was this done? Combining verse. Genesis 1 to 2, 7 days. Psalm 90 verse 4, what does it say? Thousand years is like a, a day. Okay, but remember that is only the first part of the verse. The second part of the verse says, or like a watch in the night. That means thousand years is equal to eight hours. Now what happens to your equation? Your algebra goes. So then they said, then somebody said creation took place 4004 BC. So 4004 BC, then 2000 AD, totally 6000. According to Psalm 90 verse 4a, it is six days. And seventh day is from Revelation 20 millennium. So, wow, deep. Only problem is, we were all waiting for 2000, 2000. How many preachers told us about 2000? Now, why are we not preaching that anymore? Because we did not learn this kind of false combination. We take verses from here and there. It doesn't work. Only we become a laughing stock. So, I believe there is no way you can come up with any dates in the Bible. I have spent 41 years studying the Bible very hard. That's my calling in life, just to study the Bible. Whether people appreciate that or not, that's my calling. And so, what happens? I am confident that there is not a single way you can come up with telling Jesus is coming this year or that year. Not possible. How? All the failed prophecies till now. Hundreds of them. People wrote books, millions of people read it and got fooled or at least disturbed. So don't waste your time trying to figure out when Jesus is coming. Don't listen for one minute to a preacher who is telling you when Jesus is coming. We don't have time to waste. Do you think you and I have one day to waste? We have to do the work of God. Why should we waste time trying to figure out when Jesus is coming? How will that help us? I don't want to wait when, if somebody tells me he's coming after six months, I don't want to wait. I want to be ready today and do the work of God.